saying? I, I'm confused. Um, yeah, so I am recording now. So the, the, to the WhatsApp group, right? Uh, yeah. You know, I don't know, to be honest. Like, I think that, like, def, like so here, here, here's my, here, my, what I believe is this. People who don't know anyone who's been affected or aren't in that sphere of influence probably think it's fake. But doesn't everybody, I mean, I feel like I know so many people who have it, who've had it, died from it, or one of their family has died from it. Okay, forget have it. Like, I know so many, I know, I know people who have died or have family members who've died from it in the last month or whatever. Mm -hmm. like, I don't understand how that's fake. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I think they're like, well, people die from the flu. So to me, I not honestly this much. I mean, yeah, yeah, they do, but I mean, I don't know anyone who's ever died of the flu, or, I mean you know what life is like. I mean, there's probably a sort of a rate at which people, you know, or known people, you know, secondary level die. Right. And this is way, 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 way higher than that rate. Right. Right. Um, I, sh I should give you a formal introduction, by the way. Uh, first time on this channel, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, this is Dr. Jonathan Brown from Georgetown university. He is not a health expert. <laughs> he is a professor of Islamic studies, right? But, uh, you, I, you, you seems that you, you 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 got a lot of you got multiple interests. Movie critic as well, which I think we'll get into later. Um, you always have you always have like really nice movie references. Oh, well, like, that's Man. nice to know. I'm glad to, I'm glad to know somebody appreciates that. You know, maybe you and Omar Muzaffar could start your own movie podcast during this quarantine. Yeah, you know, we he and I were in graduate school together. Actually, I think we were in some of the same classes together. Yeah, I was in a um. A, so yesterday I was doing uh he he teaches like Quran like at three o'clock Central Time every every day during Ramadan, like kind of like a tough year. So I'm in this class yesterday, like do he's we're doing Surto Bakara. And I get a text from Tanzan from Boys in a Cave. And he's like, hey, I need an I need an emergency co-host right now. Cause my co-host isn't waking up. <laughs> Cause it's they, they record in Australia after Fudger. So mm -hmm. uh, I know you were on their show not too long ago. So I had to jump on and dip out of his class and but no, but yeah, the, is his co-host the, the 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 white guy, the Sicilian yeah. guy? Yep, yep. Raphael yep. or something? Raphael, Raphael. Raphael, Raphael, yeah. So uh, we had this guy named Amar Rahman. He's a uh, comedian, a Bengali oh, comedian. Oh, I love Amar Rahman. That's, he was on there? Oh, you're so lucky. Yeah. Such a funny guy. Um, yeah, so it was all, because we're all Bengali. All three of us are Bengali. So like, yeah, we uh, hashed it out for like two hours. No, like Amar yesterday. is I mean, legitimately funny. I mean, he's not like even Muslim funny. He's just, like, you know, world class funny. I actually, opinion. I actually have not like, because I'm not much in the comedy scene. Uh, that is one on the bucket list probably. In the next week or so to find out what he is because i was planning just to google come... just go on youtube and do yeah. do amar rahman and do uh Os osama bin laden oh yeah okay <laughs> it's really funny i mean he's i actually use his comedia comedy bits in my classes sometimes mm. okay. students really like it like they i did his i use one of his things in my my day like my islamic world class day on kind of terrorism and stuff we sure do some of his comedy he's a very funny guy right yeah. So, um, yeah. So the, the, it's kind of, it's kind of been the life these days, just waking up at like 1 PM, 2 PM. Didn't get my kid going on her homework. She wakes up around the same time. Everyone's staying up with Sahur, pretty much all three kids. You right? know, it's funny. I'm trying to, uh, like I've been pushing for that. So I, I had this whole grand like approach where I was like, look, I told my wife, I was like, look, this is like the one Ramadan where we can just, like we can all do whatever we want. Like we can all just stay up all night and read Quran or watch movies or eat or whatever. Like we can just have like, the, it's like a f totally free Ramadan, you know? Yeah. And she was like, no. And that was it. And the kids like they wake, they, 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 they wake up at like normal time. So it's rough. And well, they come in like one of them, like, yeah. I, cause I can't sleep after Fudger. Like I can't just go back. Right to, I have to, I'll be up for like a couple hours after Fudger. I just can't right. sleep after Fudger. Mm. So the like I pass out maybe like seven eight a.m. and then I get woken up every day because like one of my kids will come in and be like uh, playing soccer with himself or like with a ball, but he'll doing like his own announcements. He'll be like, you know, Benzema's going for the goal. Benzema mm. shoots. Benzema scores. And then be like, he's just like this sort of, and I that's what wakes me up every day now. Mm. No, so for, for us, my wife, she, she's a physician, a gynecologist. So she's only going in right now for deliveries. So her hours even, her pay didn't get cut, but her hours got cut as far as time in the hospital. And she's always been like a night owl, right? 
Yeah. So my kids have always had like terrible sleep schedules. My in-laws live with me. They stay up all night. So the kids mm. will just hang out with them. And is your wife uh, Bengali origin? She is. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, cool. they basically have this, um, only there's only a couple of days when my wife had to go to work like eight in the morning and she was like, the kids are awake. I'm like, yeah, no kidding. Like they're not going to all of a sudden just go to sleep. <laughs> you know, yeah. you can't flip their schedule like that. Like I'd like to get them on a normal sleep schedule. Like my, you know, it, my kids are notorious for like, even my daughter during normal times, like on a school night, we'll go to bed at midnight and wake up at seven 30 to go to first grade. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, uh, kids are yeah. weird, man. They, they, I, my kids just wake up so early. It doesn't matter what happens. They'll wake up at like 7am. Uh, yeah. I, I, I couldn't handle that. I'd be <laughs> like, you know, what's going on. But anyways, um, I don't know if you know too much about this channel. Um, so like Sultans at sneakers is a channel I started back in September. Um, because you I, like sneakers? It is. You know, I wasn't, I, I, all I knew I wanted to do at the time was like, I wanted to do a channel that wasn't just a Muslim channel. You understand what I'm saying? Um, yeah, because it, would, it wouldn't have made sense. Cause like I was talking to sit like host, the backstory is like, you know, I still host for Mad Mom Luke's that's been going four years. Um, but you know, Sim wanted, he recommended that I start my own channel as well to understand the whole, pro, the, the entire in, infrastructure of a podcast just in case anything happens to him someone else could step in and like run the channel right uh because none of us knew anything else we just know how to show up to the studio and like talk right um and so when i talked to some people and, and i was like why why would i just do another muslim channel it's kind of redundant you know so what i try what i'm trying to do here is really try to understand people's like worldviews mm. in gen and keep it as broad like now, up front, to be honest, most of my contacts are still Muslim. I'm, st I'm trying to break out into, like, more non-Muslims, even beyond religion, get into, like... So, for example, a sneakerhead is a worldview, being a sneakerhead. So that's why I kept the title kind of like that. Believe in a sultanate, for example, might be, like, a, a worldview. Who knows? Or believing in a khilafah, so to speak. Um, be, be, being a white supremacist, a, part of the KKK. If I can get somebody on, I'd be happy to engage pretty much anybody at this point. Um, I just need to like do my homework and stuff and you know, whatnot. But yeah, that, that's kind of the premise of the show. I definitely don't, I, I know people don't like to do conversion stories. I know yours is already available online. So I don't like to re rehash that stuff. Um, but at the same time, I try to understand like mindset um, as people are going, as, as people grow through th phases in life. You understand what I'm saying? Mm. Yeah. So, because I think that's important for, if people can understand that, then, I think sometimes what happens is that we dehumanize people really fast and we're just like, we don't understand that there's a, there's a, we might disagree with them. We might not like the person, but we might be like, all right, I can see why they're like that though. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And I, I, I think that that's what I hope this channel can kind of, you know, you know, be at it. So um, I, I don't know if you had a chance to actually look at the outline that I have said. Um, uh, I tried to look at it, but some, I think somehow I wouldn't like, I couldn't open it on my phone and then something happened and I didn't have a chance to look at it. After. All right. Well, I'll, 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 I'll kind of run through it. Uh, if there's anything that you don't want to talk about, we can just pass. Not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I, I know growing up as a kid, you were in the Episcopalian church, right? Um, yeah. Your family, my family was, well, my dad was raised that and we, we went to church every Sunday, but, and we were actually pretty i mean he's very serious about sunday and going and doing church stuff but we would go in the morning on sunday and we were all all three of us we were acolytes so i was like a altar boy basically all the way up until maybe i was 13 or 14 okay um and uh but then the weird thing was like after you left church then like religion had no role in life at all do you think it's almost like um, a part of the culture of being like an upper class white family that church well, was I think one of those it's things? interesting, you know, so my dad, my dad's story is pretty, uh, and I actually only found out a lot about this after he died. So I didn't find out a lot about this until after he died. But um, so he was, um, he was raised very like waspy in okay. Connecticut and um, like kind of, suburbs of new york and his dad was very wealthy he kind of self-made man um owned a lot of radio stations and newspapers um 
and uh, he's a really nice guy. I mean, I, I, he died when he was, I was maybe 12 or 13. Your, your grandfather, you mean? Yeah, my dad's dad. And then, uh, but then I didn't realize it. So my, my dad's dad was born J- Jewish and Orthodox Jew. So his dad was actually the, so my great grandfather was the head of the synagogue in Warren, Ohio. And he, and so my grandfather, his brother and his sister, they all changed their names and like completely abandoned their background. A uh, background and, of Judaism? Yeah. Being Jews? Okay. Yeah. And then they, um, my grandfather married a Christian woman who was my mother, grandmother, Margot Cleveland. Now what's interesting about her was she's from this very, very illustrious family, the Cleveland family, which gave the country Grover Cleveland and, She's a descendant of Moses Cleveland, the founder of Cleveland, Ohio. They were very wealthy. But then during the Great Depression, they lost all their money. Although, oddly enough, they didn't lose it through the Depression. They were swindled out of it. But she grew up very wealthy. But then around her 20s, something like that, they lost all their money. And her mom had polio. So then she had to, st- to go and work and stay home and, and like basically take care of her mom and work and everything. So her wife went from kind of lap of luxury to, to hardship. And um, she was kind of really, ended up being like a kind of very independent, tough woman, but who had this like very snooty background. And then my grandfather met her and they got married. And then, so my dad was sort of raised in this idea that, of like being from this upper crust family, but uh, they were very wealthy, but because of my grandfather, but they, like it was sort of almost this like new, because there's a lot of, I think, unspoken insecurity about who they were. And so my dad never mentioned, for example, that his father was Jewish. My dad, like he almost was like too wasp, you know, waspier than the, than, than the, than the wasp, so to speak, right? <laughs> because he was like compensating for this background, which was uh, somewhat checkered, right? He was like from this, mom was from this big family but they were on falling on hard times and his dad was like this really successful guy but he was from a background that was fake basically like his name wasn't even brown that's not his real last name mm. so uh um yeah that was kind of the, my dad's background um, but I, I didn't know really but my grandmother when she was very old i remember um you know after she had a stroke i think in 2000 she would sometimes she would it was actually really interesting from a historian's perspective i mean i i don't want to take you know pleasure in someone's suffering but i mean she would she would forget what year it was she would like go back into like the 1940s and she would come and say like jack come here come here i want i'm gonna give you a nickel okay you need to go to this store on like 75th in amsterdam and there's this machine and you put this nickel in the machine you're going to get a sandwich i want you to get this sandwich you bring the sandwich here and like she would it was almost like going in a time machine she had no idea she wouldn't realize that it was like 2000 year 2000 and sometimes she would start to cry and be like we lost all our money we lost all our money and she would like relive this impoverishment so uh yeah that was interesting experience for me Mm. So it sounds to me like as like your interaction with the religion of Christianity was just this two hour window or whatever it was that you go to church. Yeah, it was right? really weird. It was like, you know, honestly, I don't, I, I hope my old Sunday school teachers aren't listening to this, but I swear, I, I swear to God, I do not. I, I just <laughs> tell my brother-in-law this right now. I was like, I still don't know what Lent is. People are like Lent. I'm like, I don't know what Lent is. <laughs> I don't know. When is Lent? What do you do for Lent? What I think that's is, a Catholic I, thing, though, right? I, I don't know. I think also Episcopalians do it. Oh, really? Okay. Because Episcopalians <laughs> are very much like Catholics, except okay. they just don't have the Pope. But it's it's you like a cons- but it's like the whole setup where you're getting dressed up in a, like your Sunday best going in. Is that how the setup was for for church? for church? For church, yeah. When you were a kid. Yeah. Well, my dad would, but I would. We would wear. It didn't matter what we wore because we would go and change into the uh, like, do you ever see, you know, the like Prince Harry and whoever these people are in the Royal family and they have these like church events and there's the kids who wear 
red it's like a red robe and then a white outer upper part so it's okay. like a, it's a, and then the, the the so there's like a white almost shirt over a red basically a thobe yeah and then during okay i know this all i know is during lent whenever the heck that is you wear a black thobe and a okay. white thing over it right so mm-hmm. so that's what you wear as alt, as acolyte or altar boy right and you start out as altar boy you start carrying the candles like you carry candle in procession that's like the first thing you do then you graduate up to carrying like the, the cross and the flag or or, or the flag okay right? then you graduate up. this is when you're like kind of a teenager is you graduate up to actually helping the minister prepare the communion mm-hmm. which is pretty cool um and then you one of the good things is you get you're like one of the first people to get communion which is how I knew that I was definitely going to be an alcoholic because I love the wine so much. Like, and they would come and they'd, they'd let you like take a sip out of the wine. <laughs> and I would just like, try to take the biggest <laughs> chug I could. I loved it. Nice. So it seems to be like you weren't really interacting with the Bible as much. No, in, in it, was, uh, to no it was kind of, sorry, I'm just going to close this window. I think it's making noise. Okay. So, um, yeah, like I said, I, I think I really only <laughs> understood Christianity much later in my life. Like when I went to graduate school, I, I really started, I was like, wow, this is actually really interesting. I mean, I think, I think if I had been, I think if Christianity had been explained to me more intelligently, I probably would have had more of an involvement with it. But I had no, I had essentially no involvement with anything beyond just the idea of God. I believed in God, but everything else was just completely, uh, I, I don't want to say it didn't make sense to me because I don't think it was even explained to me well enough for it to pass a test of making sense or not. It just was immaterial to me. Yeah. You know, for, it's interesting. You're, you're like our experience in that sense, like growing up Muslim in like Columbus, Ohio, it was pretty much you, you went to public school and then you went to either Saturday school or Sunday school for like three hours. And you like went through Arabic, Islamic studies, et cetera. But really you don't want to be there because you're either missing cartoons if it was Saturday or Sunday, you were missing the NFL game, yeah. right? So, and that was like a lot of our experience growing up. So, you know, over time, you you know, you, you're getting information. I think that's what it felt like. Like, um, you're going to class, you're getting information. Oh, yeah, this is what this is. But, like, there is no, like, connection. It just, it's like taking a history class. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, this, like, you're, like, you're, you're not, you're, like, you're kind of, like, disconnected from, right? So, could could we also assume, politically speaking, your family was, uh, if you're from like a waspy family, that they were more Republican, or would you say you're no? Pro- the the opposite. Um, oh, so okay. my my uh, dad was well, he was independent, but he was very liberal um, about like he was when he was in college, he got really involved in the civil rights movement. He went to Yale, uh, but I mean, he was like really involved. Like he went into like St. Augustine, Florida and did like voter registration and like taught people how to register themselves to vote. And he got like, it's crazy. So there's actually a, um, if I share something on the screen, is that going to show up in the podcast? Um, it'll show, if it's on the screen, it'll show up on the YouTube channel. Once I put it on YouTube. I just think it might be interesting. Let me see. Um, Cause I saw, I found this. Give it a shot. When my dad, died yeah so he was uh this is actually from the congressional record so the congressional record is like this it's basically the the official record of congress american congress right federal government do you see this the pdf i see it yeah okay so 1964 and my dad wrote this uh that's him. Yeah, he wrote this reflection of his time working that summer in St. Augustine. And uh, it's crazy. Like, I mean, he basically got, uh, there's a lot of things that happened. But one thing that happened is he got, like, beaten up by these, like, white thugs and, like, the police. It was, like, a march. And so he was, like, the white guy with all these, like, that black people. And they just, they just started, like, the, the white people just started pounding on my dad big time. Um, he got, like, sent to the hospital. And and then, like, when he was in the hospital, like, Dr. King came and checked on him. And he was, like, a he was a teenager, basically. He was not even, I mean, he was in, uh, 
He was in college. I mean, I don't know if he was a teenager, but he was basically like 19 to 20 years old. Sure, in the 60s. So yeah. he was really into, he was really committed to this. And uh, he was really also very anti-Vietnam War. Uh, but my grandfather was pro-Vietnam War. My, my, my dad is very anti-Vietnam War. And um, he was really active on, in that group at Yale with this guy, a pretty famous name, like Reverend William Sloan Coffin, I think was his name, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so my dad was like to the, like, when I became Muslim, like, he was always really supportive of that. Um, he was so in a way, one way he was very open-minded. Okay. Um, and I remember when, you know, I, I wanted to get married to my wife. My wife's father had been through a lot of like, he basically had been persecuted by the U.S. government like after 9-11 for being a Palestinian activist. I mean, he was like the, the kind of test case for a lot of these like Patriot Act energy, not, not necessarily the specific laws, but like that kind of idea of going after Muslims like this. Right. Um, and so my wife's name had really become like toxic. I mean, it was... I mean, for her and her family, like they couldn't get jobs. And uh, I mean, that really only changed kind of maybe a little bit like under Obama, but really only under Trump. Like when suddenly being Muslim and like being edgy and mm. like being Kendall Jenner and giving like Pepsi's to cops and stuff like became kind of cool. Like then suddenly it's like, oh, like resistance is cool. Before that, I mean, um, so when I remember I, 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 could, I wanted to get married to her and I kind of basically had this phone call with my dad and I was like, look, I was basically saying like, I want to marry somebody who's like, there's going to be some baggage, you know, like it's mm -hmm. going to be, it's not going to be like some random white person. And uh, I remember always remember, I mean, I had a lot of issues with my dad. Like I could sit around and criticize my dad to, for a couple of hours. Don't get me wrong. Um, but one thing I will always have a huge amount of respect for him for is he said, I asked him if it was okay. And he said, if I said, if you didn't, he said, if you didn't marry her because of this, I would never talk to you again. Wow. Which was like pretty, I mean, I, that was really principled, you know, I have to yeah. really say, I respect that a lot. Um, so he, there were certain things that like, he was very, who was, who was really principled and, and that, you know, let's just say like liberal in, you know, mm -hmm. in a kind of good sense about, uh, and there are other things about him that were very, uh, I think a lot of things that people today talk about as like white privilege. I think that my dad, um, you know, I think for some of my dad's generation, I actually, I think a lot when, you know, people talk about like Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and their kind of criticisms about Hamza Yusuf, I see a lot, I see a lot in like similarity with my father with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. I feel I think they're they're all they're some similar generation, um, and it's uh, I think a lot of white people from that generation, you know, kind of upper middle class, upper educated white people, they're just they have certain blinders about the world that it's just hard for them to to get around. Like my dad would, you know, he worked his whole career in development. Like he worked almost his whole career at the World Bank. He went to Harvard Business School and went to he went to work for the World Bank. And his whole life, he was committed to helping poor people. I mean, that was, I remember when I went to live in Egypt after college, I remember talking to my dad once on the phone. I was like, it's just, people are so poor here. I, I don't, I don't even know how to deal with it. It like makes me so, I don't, I can't even do, I don't know how to deal with it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I said, how you've traveled to all these places in the world. How do you deal with it? He said, that's why I went to work for the World Bank. Like he he was in the Peace Corps in Chad in like the 1960s to avoid going to Vietnam, et cetera, et cetera. But like that experience of, ex you know, in encountering poverty motivated him his whole career to work in development. Um, now, he also happened to go work for the World Bank where they paid him like half a million dollars a year and he had, yeah. you know, like the, the best healthcare package you could imagine. So, I mean, it's not like he suffered in his life. Sure. Uh, but, you know, so he, he was like a very committed, per I mean, if you said anything around my dad that was racist, like if you said something like that someone who had this color skin should be treated different than that color skin, like he would, that was like the only thing that would get you beat. Like that, that he would just, his eyes would go red. Mm. But there were so many other things I remember my dad saying that 
people today would just be like, that's the most racist thing I've ever heard. Like, but he, because he was just like, for him, it was like obvious that there were certain cultures that were backward yeah, and needed to change. And there were other cultures that were good. Like, and he had no problem with that, that value judgment. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that made him in a way, uh, gave him certain biases. Uh, but in, in actually in a lot of ways, I think it was more, it was less about race and more about class. I think my dad was, I think there's a, I think a lot of people in America, in addition to being racist, but I think there's a lot of class classism too, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and you can see that with, you know, the way people talk about Trump voters, you can see it the way people talk about, um, you know, in the context of like COVID-19 and uh, people's reactions to that. Um, so I guess the whole way, this is all a long way of saying that, you know, he was a, he was a really, a very wonderful and principled and courageous guy, but he was also a product of his time and his place. And that I think always was going to uh, create blinders for him. Yeah. Like, for example, he loved Ronald Reagan. My dad loved Ronald Reagan. Okay. And if you sat and said, like, well, Ronald Reagan has this problem, that problem, this problem. Like, I remember I, I got in one of the first conversations I had with my father-in-law. And I went to, like, my wife's house when I was – I can't remember if we were married already or if I was, like, trying to court her or something. Yeah. She didn't really like me that much. So I went the parents' route. Like, I went and, like, you know, went over the parents, which is, like, of course, the, the, the worst route. <laughs> No, no, I was like, I was like, why? Wow. I was like, I was, why didn't someone tell me that was not the route you should take? So, but I remember, I can't remember. I think I told, I just sort of said what my dad said. I was like, oh yeah, I love Ronald Reagan, and my my father in law, he really let me have it. I mean, he sat down and like talked to me for about two hours about it. By the end of it, I was like, wow, yeah, Ronald Reagan was terrible. But I mean, my, my dad, like, I don't know if he, if you, if he had had that conversation with my father in law, I don't know how he would have responded. Um, mm. anyway, but. So he was a bundle of contradictions. As but, but, you know, it's interesting. You, Reagan's an interesting example because you, I think you might be a year or two older than me, I think. But we were probably, we grew up, we remember the 80s. You remember as a kid, Reagan being president, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know what I mean? I remember my dad was a grad student at Purdue University and Reagan was visiting. For, and we used to live off the strip um, from the, off the airport, the air, you know, student housing was. I remember his motorcade coming through. And, you know, I've all, and growing up, probably up until the last few years, I've always like thought Ronald Reagan was a great guy. I never really understood like what the, you know, and then you hear about other things that you, you start learning more things as you get older. But um, I mean, cause at the end of the day, I think you're looking at it like, oh, well, my life's good. Things are, things yeah. are great. You remember happy times. He was the president, right? <laughs> There's yeah. no war going on. Maybe the Cold War, but um, yeah, I mean, if you're like someone living in Nicaragua or something, you know, yeah. or some or Beirut or a lot of other places, right? Your your experience is different. But um, I mean, one thing, yeah. So my dad, I mean, when Reagan died, my dad actually went and like stood by like the side. You know, they had his motor casket or whatever went down yeah. the street, and my dad like went and stood in in the parade and mm. like gave salams to <laughs> Ronald Reagan <laughs> as, he, as his body went by or whatever. Yeah. Um, but the, but then another thing is and this, I think, I don't know if this came necessarily from, more from my mom, but my mom taught me, like, she always taught me to look, to consider different points of view with, with complete openness, right? So don't ever, like, don't ever uh, always look through at things from different perspectives and accept, accept the possibility of looking at things from other perspectives. Uh, she was an anthropologist, so I think this was a big thing for her. Mm. So, but I remember when we, because my friends would always make fun of me. They always like, "Oh, you love Arnold Schwarzenegger, ha ha ha!" You know, I bet you love True Lies. You know, my Muslim friends would be like, "I'm like, yeah, I love Arnold Schwarzenegger. And yeah, I love True Lies. I'll just tell you why I love True Lies. You guys, you remember True Lies, right? I know the movie. I've never seen. Okay, it. so I just you know probably haven't seen it because you're Muslim and your parents probably were like, "You're not going to see True Lies because guess who's the bad guys in True Lies." I, I, you know what? I don't think I was ever intrigued to see True Lies. <laughs> okay, well then you're, yeah, you know, yeah. I don't I'm know just a little weird. About, yeah, I don't I'm know just what to say about you if you don't like Arnold Schwarzenegger enough to. But okay, no, so look, top, actually, okay, we'll get Muslims to it. don't like True Lies. Muslims don't like True Lies, and that's fine. Right. right. But let me tell you, I remember seeing True Lies in the theater 
I went by myself. I just, I don't know how the heck I did this. I must have like, it must've been like right after I learned how to drive. Mm -hmm. I remember driving my mom's Volkswagen, not Volkswagen, Volvo. And I went to the theater in Bethesda and it was a sunny, it was a rainy summer day. It was rainy. And I went to the theater and I watched True Lies. And there's a scene where like the, the Muslim bad guy is like doing his like terrorist speech. He's like, you bomb our women and children from afar. And you dare to call us terrorists, right? Yeah. And I remember, the, I, I remember this. This was way before I was Muslim. I was, I'm sitting in the theater. I was like, yeah, it's actually a pretty good point. So that's, that was my mom telling me to be open-minded. And always, always look at things from different perspectives. But uh, I think that, you know, in order to do that, you have to be introduced to those other perspectives. And I think that for a lot of Americans, like my dad or me growing up or you, right? Yeah. Who's going to be Ronald Reagan? You just don't have another perspective. Like, who's going to come and tell you, like, I'm going to give you the perspective of Central Americans who suffer because of America's, like, proxy wars in our, their country. Yeah. No one's going to tell you that. I mean, unless you happen to interact with those people. Yeah, or the war on drugs, if you're in the inner city and be infected by that, right? Yeah, which um, I didn't have any interaction with. Maybe you did, but I didn't. Not then. Like, well, even when I got older, I didn't at that depth. Like, it's not something you were – I wasn't living in those communities. I had – my friends in school may have been living in those communities, but it's not like that was being discussed at school, yeah. right? You talk about the the NBA game of the week or something, right? Um, by the way, for the record, Schwarzenegger, uh, the, the first Terminator movie is probably in my top five all time. Okay, fine. So just so, so I don't – like on Schwarzenegger, good. Uh, yeah, it's not, it's not that. I, I think the subject matter of True Lies – but I, I guess the theme of Terminator is really what got me more so – I, I guess I've never I've never been someone who's like I, I don't I, I I'm not a person who follows actors. Does that make sense? So I don't I don't follow actors either, except except Arnold Schwarzenegger, who I okay. have a huge amount of. I just had he just had a big 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 role in my life. You know, like when I was I know people always laugh at me when I say this, but like when I was growing up, we I was a teenager. My friend Brendan and I, Brendan, if you ever watch this or listen to this, just shout out to my friend Brendan Kerr. So Brendan and I would sit. We go in my basement and we have the, we had this like Bowflex machine. You know what Bowflex? Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, right. <laughs> the Bowflex. Yeah. And we would do, we had the Arnold Schwarzenegger bodybuilding encyclopedia. And we would go through that and we would read like the lessons. And he had so, he, there, I really learned from this like a sense of discipline. Yeah. And the idea that your, your mind always, your mind is what gives out, not your body. Your body will, your mind always gives out before your body. So your mind is your weakest point. Mm -hmm. And you have to strengthen your mind. You have to strengthen your discipline. You have to, uh, you can't let pain or suffering uh, may render you inactive, right? So I see this all the time, actually, with my students, my, especially grad students. Because grad school is like, I don't know what happens in grad school. People's lives are like always falling apart. I mean, it's just like something happens to people in grad school, it's just a disaster area. Mm -hmm. When I happened when I was a grad student, it happened to other people, right? And so, when this happens to my students, I just say to them, like, look, you can, this pain and this chaos can either be an impediment to you finishing and doing good work or it can be fuel. You know, pain can be something that stops you or it can be something that pushes you forward and you have to make it something that pushes you forward. And so that really I learned from this, um, that, that time in my life. And uh, it's just, as I reflect on my, um, reflect more on life as I get older. I, I think that that sense of discipline was really crucial for, for anything to the extent that I've contributed to my accomplishments. That was right. a big part of it. I think. Now, were you, were you allowed to watch some of the Schwarzenegger movies as a kid? Like, Oh yeah. So my parents were, Oh my God. I don't know. I actually like can't believe the stuff they let, let us watch. Do you see total recall as a kid? Of course I saw total. That's not even, that's not even, I'm okay. Did you ever see a movie called revenge of the nerds? Uh, no, I have not. I've heard of okay. it. Okay. Yeah. So Revenge of the Nerds has full frontal female nudity. Okay. Like multiple <laughs> times. Okay. And that's just like, that's just a visual. It's like the, the, the content is matches that, right? Okay. My parents bought a Betamax machine in, I don't know, 1985, 1984. Let's just put it somewhere around that time. Mm -hmm. They bought with it Revenge of the Nerds. Dark Crystal, Conan the Barbarian, Witness, and I can't remember what else. Okay, on the porkies. So my, yeah, <laughs> basically, like to, you know, my 
my sisters and I watched, my sisters who are, by the way, two and four years younger than me, okay. watched Revenge of the Nerds. So let's say it came out in 1984. I was probably seven or eight years old when I saw, I'm going to say seven when I watched <laughs> that movie. And I didn't just watch it once. I watched it so many times that my sisters and I memorized the movie. And there's this one dance scene in the movie, like a musical number they do. <laughs> if, you, if any of you have seen Revenge of the Nerds, you know this. It's a talent skit, a talent show and competition at the end of the movie. My sisters and I did a performance of this in my grandparents' house. And I, to this day, I know the whole, all the words of these songs. And my parents just didn't care. Like, I, so I cannot tell you. And also, Conan, Conan the Barbarian is not a uh, rated PG or G movie. Uh, okay. If you've ever seen it. It's a great Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. I don't know if you, you obviously. I, yeah, no, I, yeah, I know he did, he did that movie. Okay. Did, did, did an a, amazing movie. Of it, so, yeah. But, uh. I mean, my, this is just to go show. This is the stuff that my parents let us watch on our own. Yeah. When we were, when I was, let's say, five, six or seven, and my sisters was were three and five. <laughs> so I do not know what in God's name their reasoning was. And I remember, like, they would sometimes let us watch Miami Vice with them. Mm-hmm. Did you ever see Miami Vice, the TV show? I mean, there was, like, I, I'm still traumatized. Like, I think back on scenes that remember from that movie john john no you know what i because my from, my, that, from, my that, par- from that show yeah yeah my parents never like they always were strict like strict about they never watched miami vice my mom watched dallas and dynasty the soap operas i had to leave the room um they, they kicked us out they kicked me out whenever they were gonna watch something right yeah um i was sorry about total recall my buddy who's now uh i think he's an er doc in cleveland of all going back to cleveland um we were we were like ten years old, and I wasn't there. He told me the story. His 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 friend from across the street brought over Total Recall, the video, the VHS. Pops it in, they're watching it, and there's a scene when there's this one alien it's chick, just three three breasted woman. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Right. His mom walks in at that exact scene, and <laughs> she, and this is like a Bengali Muslim lady, and she just lost her mind. <laughs> she she just screamed. Yeah, I think I think he was telling me the story. So it was just like yeah, this idea like like bro, like my my parents would flip out over. I was I remember this one time I was watching. I was like probably in middle school watching Boy Meets World, right? And there's a scene where Corey's kissing Topanga, and my dad walks by and he accuses me of like not not only watching the scene but liking the scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so my parents are pretty much the opposite of that i don't know what their reasoning was but yeah <laughs> so that was uh that was never a big deal in fact i would like even as an adult my mom would be like let's watch you know weeds and there'd be like sex scenes and i was just like oh my god i mean i was like in my 30s or something i was like, <laughs> I, was like I can't believe i'm in the room with my mom and this is she did not care she just had no hang-ups about that stuff at all Mm. Yeah, I, don't, I had a, I had a few friends in school that were like that. They would like they would actually go to the theaters with the parents and watch like R rated stuff all the time. Oh God, yeah, I remember. Um, you know, it's now all these thoughts, memories are coming back. <laughs> I remember one time like we were in California on a family vacation. Basic Instinct was on like the TV, cable TV, but it was like Showtime or something in yeah. a hotel. I was, like watched it with my parents. I was like, oh. <laughs> there was like one room, right? We just had one hotel room. <laughs> right. Oh my God, I probably have to go to therapy for all this stuff. And, and that was like supposed to be NC seventeen. There was a whole yeah, debate was, when that came out. Was, I can't. That's where I saw Basic Instinct was in. I can still ma- remember the hotel room. It's a hotel room in like middle, you know, middle state of California, like around San Simeon or something like that. There's a there's a documentary on Netflix called the Don't F with Cats. I don't know if you've seen that or not. No, I have not seen that. If you, it it's 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 basic. It, long story short, it, it's a it's a guy who the serial killer who basically modeled his life after um, Catherine Trammell. The one, the woman in Basic, Basic Instinct? Basic Instinct, yep. Like he, he, like he did the ice pick murder and everything. You know, he said, it, like it's, it's like he played this entire, like, it, and it's weaved over three years. It's crazy. It's a real life story. Um, this guy in Canada, uh, it's on Netflix. It's really disturbing. Um, but, you know, if you see. Yeah, I'll tell yeah. my wife about that. She likes real crime stuff. Yeah, it's true. It's true crime. It's 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 real good. 
it's just like really disturbing because um there's a reason it's called don't f with cats but yeah um I, talk about a tangent though but uh so, so anyways you, 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 let's, let's backtrack here you, you go to california for like boarding school and all that um and then i remember you're talking about like yeah it's you know at that you do what high school kids want to do you know, we got we gotta we gotta find girls to get with and See if we can get booze. Yeah, and- it was funny. My my <laughs> friend and I were just talking to my friend the other day on the phone. We were talking about my friend from high school. And we we're saying, like, he asked me, he, you know, we've been friends for many years. He's like, you know, he's like, I always wondered, like, when you became Muslim, was this like why did you do that? Like he he wasn't he wasn't he was curious. Like it wasn't a accus he wasn't inquisitorial or anything. And he said, Was that like a continuation of something in your life? Or was that a change? And I said, I was telling him, I was like, yeah, don't you remember in, in high school, I was so, um, I was just so anxious. I was like overwhelmed by existential angst. I, I was like de- incapacitated, you know, by, by, by being unsure as to the, my meaning in the world and like what, what was the meaning of life? What was the purpose of life if you could just, your existence could be snuffed out so easily? And, uh, and I said like, yeah, you know, it was, like either I had to have the answers to that or I needed a girlfriend. Like those are the two, like yeah. the two things. Like those are, uh, it was like, look, if, if I had like a girlfriend, then I probably wouldn't have had these issues. But I mean, my friend was like, yeah, we never were much, we we're very lucky with that. Um, but I mean, uh, so I think, you know, I wanted the same thing the other guys wanted. But at the same time, I think that, uh, you know, I, I think I was maybe more thoughtful than a lot of people or maybe just had more time to think and less other activities to distract me. Was it an all boys boarding school? No, it wasn't. It was co-ed, but, um, but the girls had their own dorms. Okay. I mean, but there was a lot of chances to, okay. To explore the relationship between men and women. (laughs) But, uh, yeah, I was not, uh, I wasn't very successful. Do, do you ever wonder, like, did you say your dad went to the same boarding school or he went to a separate? No, actually, he went to boarding school. And he actually went to boarding school called Kent in Connecticut. And do you know who was a teacher at that same school at the same time? Hamza Yusuf's father. Really? Yeah. Uh, wow. Hamza Yusuf's father's, like, first job was teaching English literature at Kent. And I, I wish my dad were, I wish I'd had been able to ask my dad this question if he had had his, had his dad as a teacher. Mm. Um, and then other weird things, Hamza Yusuf went to the school in the same town as where I went to high school, which is this I remember little, that. I, yeah. little town in California called Ojai, California. It was like the small, he, you, I think you said something about it. It was like the, it was like the lesser version or something. Yeah. Well, I would, I would your school was superior. Was, my school was better. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so my dad, but he sent me to boarding school because he said I needed to build character. What, what like so yeah what what like what is the deal with boarding school like why 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 does a parent like is it like a military academy or like no what, is, what does he mean by that quite different um the opposite uh i don't know what that means i mean i think that back then you know there wasn't really there wasn't the internet there wasn't cell phone you don't have cell phones i mean we didn't have tvs so you kind of just sort of just by yourself, like with your friends. I mean, you're kind of in a school environment and you're with your friends all the time. And um, you kind of have to learn to fend for yourself, I guess. Mm. I mean, you don't have a family to protect you and you don't have a refuge to go to. So you kind of just make, you know, end up, I mean, I ended up having a lot of fun. I loved it. But um, I mean, it certainly makes characters. And, and to this day, like I can usually identify someone who's been to boarding school from, mm. uh, because there's just some certain amount of personality. Uh, you, you get a lot of characters um, you, in, the, in, the, in the kind of, not in the moral sense, but in the kind of outrageous sense. You, you did all four years there of high school? Yeah, all four years. Um, but, uh, but I mean, in retrospect, like I, I don't, I would, I would not send my kids to boarding school. I mean, I, I'm kind of like, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love my my school, and I I don't know anything. My, I can't imagine my life being anything other than it is. I, I don't know what how what I would compare it to, you know. But I I wish I had been able to spend more time with my my parents. You know, I mm. I basically didn't really see my family from 
age of 14 onward. I mean, I was never mm-hmm. at home after that. And I, I wish I could have been with my family. I think I, I could have learned a lot from them, especially from my mom. Yeah. And I wish I, I think they could have helped me through a lot of the, the challenges and agonies that teenagers suffer. But, you know, it's kind of on my own with my friends who were doing, going through the same stuff. Sure. But what kind of advantage do you think it, set, it's, it puts you in as far as like getting into school like Georgetown? For your I mean, it was a good school, so I mean, I had a very good education. But I, I think you could have had the same thing at a at a day school. But do you, do you think you would have like a lot of people have this perception that kids from boarding schools, it's almost like sometimes they're feeder programs, right? Um, yeah, but I think they're feeder programs. I mean, I would just say private school, good private schools. I mean, a boarding school is just a good private. In theory, is a good private school, but you could have the same thing from a from a a, a non boarding private school. Mm, yeah uh, I, i'd say that uh yeah i mean you just get like your personality gets really shaped by the school a lot more than and actually shaped by your friends and that's i think you know i i wish I, again i i love my friends from from high school and you know i i don't dislike i, d- I don't dislike myself i like myself i think i'm you know i have problems but i'm i generally am like hey yeah i'm like uh I'm like a pretty funny guy, you know. I would love to hang out with me. I would love to. I mean, I'm a really fun guy to hang out with, you know. So the, but, you know, I, I think that sometimes I wonder if if it would have been better if I had been with my family. Right, but at this point in time, you're still hanging out with like all your friends are white. They're all white kids at the boarding school, or is well, there... they're they're white or honorary whites. I mean, there's in California, you have a you know sizable Asian population, so sort of a lot yeah. of them were. Okay. Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, uh-huh. uh, but they were, um, I mean, I had almost no, I mean, this is something that kind of interesting. I really didn't interact with like African Americans until I became Muslim. Mm. My whole, like in my whole life. Really. Yeah. I mean, I didn't really, I didn't interact with somebody who was not from my social class Yeah. until I became Muslim. Mm. So even like as you, when your parents are, you, you mentioned your dad had like had a more was like more of like a classical like well like a he politically liberal right were his, were his friend circles were your the your parents friends were they kind of aligned in the same way of thinking or were, yeah well I grew up in Washington D.C. I mean okay. so my dad's friends were a lot of them were in politics mm-hmm. in government uh, or lawyers they were very intelligent and that to this day I'll say this about Washington D.C. is it's a city, you know, the, the sort of DC area, is that it's a, a it's a lot of very intelligent people with jobs that are not challenging enough for them. So you have a huge amount of excess, unused and eager to be used brain power. Mm, okay. Um, so you, I mean, I grew up around people who were very accomplished, very intelligent, very caring and loving. Um, you know, we had kind of a friend, a group of my family friends who we all spent time together. And I've dedicated some of my books to these folks. Um, some of them, like my godmother, uh, Julia Taft, to, um And uh, so I, w- I was really spoiled for love. I mean, I was, I was lavished with love and attention and concern and care. And I had lots of role models around me. Um, and I'd say that they were are not... I'd say they were, they, today they would be kind of, they would probably all be sort of center Democrats. Um, but back then, a lot of them were actually Republicans, but that mm. was kind of the same thing back then. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, so, um, yeah, I'd say that was, but very high standards for, for, for performance. You know, you, you, you had very high standards for what you were expected to accomplish. Gotcha. So, so, so now at Georgetown, you, you take this class on Islam and you, you like it. What was it about that class or the subject of Islam that was attractive? It was like civilization, theology, spirituality, like. Yeah, so it was really interesting. I mean, I remember, um, and sorry if I've said this stuff before, I mean, people ask me this question a lot, but I mean. I, I try to filter out. I, I like did like, so I, I listened to every interview, even the ones we did with you on Mad Mumluks. And yeah, did we talk about this stuff already? We did. We didn't. We didn't. I, I'm so, I'm trying to like 
So if I know it already, no, because yeah, I mean, I'm happy to talk about. It. I just feel bad that you know from like I, I don't like I don't like regurg I hate regurgitating the material if someone else already covered it. I'd rather just have them go back and listen to the other podcast. Yeah, so I'll try and get into maybe aspects that I don't yeah. normally talk about. So right, I mean, um, so the summer after high school, and this is just, I mean, this is a little insight into my own life, maybe. But like you know, I was. Um, like I, I worked during it's at certain times in college. I worked as like a, in the as a job, but yep. I chose to do that. I didn't have to do that. So my my grandparent, like I said, my grandfather was very wealthy, and he paid for all of our education all the way through high school, right? Okay. And he left all of us like sizable. He basically paid for our college, so we had no. I had no need for any money. Mm -hmm. Um. In fact, he, these things, these funds were like trust funds were given to us when we turned 18. So uh, during college, I didn't have to work. I did sometimes, I chose to work, right? Uh, but I didn't have to. And alhamdulillah, this was like a real blessing. I mean, I, I freely acknowledge this blessing. I'm very grateful. Um, I'll also say that I did, I've done, I haven't wasted it. So but my point being is that so between high school and college that summer i didn't have to, i didn't do anything i didn't work i i literally i don't know what i did that summer i think i just drank and partied with my friends and pursued activities and uh but one thing i did do is i read into all of Sherlock Holmes mysteries. Mm -hmm. And I just remember my brain was like, it started just like revving like an engine. It was just like, I wanted to learn so much. I really, it's just kind of weird to, to think about. Like I was just so hungry to learn. So when I started college. Let, let, me, I, let me backtrack a little bit. So like Sherlock Holmes, like that's, is that something randomly you're just interested in? Cause. So I don't know how that happened. I think I can't remember how it happened. Uh, all I remember is I had this, I'd buy these like cheap cigars. God knows how my mom allowed me to do this stuff. I swear, my parents were so <laughs> permissive. They were so, their, their attitude was, they never said this, but I knew this actually. They were like, you can do whatever you want in the house. They, they were like, we don't want you out of the house. That's very smart. We don't want you getting busted by the cops. We don't want drunk driving, right? You do whatever you want. Yeah. You want to bring your friends over, go into the basement, smoke this, drink that, do this, do that. No, one, no one's going to care. So I basically had like free reign. And I, I would buy these like cheap ass, sorry, cheap cigars. There, I, I, I don't censor this show. This isn't a Muslim yeah, show. Yeah, so I would, I would, and I would <laughs> sit and uh, smoke them and read Sherlock Holmes. I don't know why I was doing this. <laughs> Something must have happened that someone must have like given me the idea that this is what would be a good use of my time. But this I- is uh, going into your freshman year at Georgetown. Yeah, so this is the between college, like graduating, graduating high school and starting college. And that was what I did. And I also traveled that summer. Where did I go? I can't remember where I went. I must have traveled somewhere. That, that was the time when my father was working in Russia in the former Soviet Union. And I would usually go with him to Russia or Central Asia in the summer. Uh, but I can't remember what I did that summer. Sure. So I, I, but I remember reading all the Sherlock Holmes and then, so it just got my brain revving. And so when I started college, I just, I was like so hungry to learn. And I took a class on intro to biblical literature, which you're required to take at Georgetown. You either take Problem of God or Intro to Biblical Literature. And I remember being really interested in the Old Testament, but I was just like, this is not really for me. I just said, this is not, I just, um, this is not like what I believe in. Um, and then I took the second class. We have to take two theology classes. So I picked the second one. I remember, I, I remember it so crazy. I can remember sitting in my dorm room looking through the old, we used to have a paper course catalog mm -hmm. and it's called Islamic thought and practice. And I remember picking it and then I was like, okay, whatever sounds interesting. 
and I took that class and that was uh, spring semester my freshman year. And uh, so that was, I, if I could tell you the number of people who took that class either with me or I think there might've been two sections or the year before me. So Intisar Rub, who's a professor at Harvard, mm -hmm. Suad Abdul Khabir, who is a professor at University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. She wrote the book Muslim Cool. Yep. Right. Um, she did. She went to Georgetown for undergrad. Yeah. Okay. She was in my class. So we were okay. in the same class. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Carl Sharif Al Tobgi, who's a professor at Brandeis, right, and now he does mm -hmm. an Islamic seminary in Boston. Yep. Um. Who else? Abdul Malik. Ryan. Ahmed. No. Abdul, oh. Abdul he, Malik Noor, Abdul Malik Ryan, he was also at Georgetown. He, oh, he was in law school, though, right? Yeah. Yeah. We yeah, would yeah. see each other at Juma. Okay. And Abdul Malik Ahmed, who's the guy who does, um, he's in like, uh, what's that? Dean. There's three singers. Dean Squad. No, no, no. Not Dean Squad. Joshua Salam. Hmm. Dean. Hey, Layla. Layla. So it's like three three African American Muslim guys, Native Dean, Native Dean, that's Native it. Dean. Okay, the old school. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Old school. He yeah, also yeah. does. Uh, so he was in the, took those classes. So the, all these people went through this this professor Faruqi Mason and Faruqi's class, and I think she had a big impact on this. I don't want to speak for those other people. I could speak for some of them because I know for a fact, but I don't want to speak for all of them. Mm -hmm. But I think she had a big impact on a lot of those people. Mm. Um, that class is really. So if you look at like the, a lot of very successful Muslims in American life today come from Georgetown in the late 1990s. I gotcha. So like when you're you, you going back to the Old Testament, like what, is there something you could pinpoint as you read through it that you just didn't, was it, because like a lot of Christians even like to dismiss the Old Testament because yeah, it's, I mean, it's like I a think, wrathful God yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't the, the wrath of God element. Okay. So much as it was just, it was just, it's a product of history. I mean, it was clear. I mean, and I think, by the way, you know, most Christians and Jews acknowledge this, which is that this is like a product of history. Mm -hmm. It's a human expression in history, you know. Uh, and it's interesting, and you have kind of interesting conceptions of, of God. And of course, interesting ethical and theological questions are posed and answered in ways that actually Muslims think are totally valid, like the story of Job or mm -hmm. Joseph, right? So a lot of, I mean, um, no one, you know, I'm not going to debate the tremendous wisdom embedded in, in the Old Testament. Sure. But, um, you know, it, it just wasn't, you know, my mind at that point was like craving logic. It was, I wanted a logical equation. And mm. the Old Testament isn't a lot, isn't part of a logical equation. It's a, it's a, it's art, not science, you know? It's, um, mm. And so I think that uh, when I learned about Islam, I learned about this like much, I mean, just like a very pared down, like the, the pure form of monotheism. Mm -hmm. you, you never had an inkling that like, a lot of times what happens is when people start like searching or I, would you, it doesn't even sound like you're actually searching. You just oh, you're I was interested. definitely in high oh, school. Oh, you were searching. Big time. Oh, okay. Big time. No. Okay. I mean, so, but, but I didn't know what to do. I mean, I was really into Taoism. Yeah. I was really okay. into yeah Taoism, especially. I was really into. So did you like? But a lot of times, what happen, What I've seen is that when people start like getting interested in this kind of stuff, they default first. They want to exhaust what their own background is first. Like, for example, like I would, so someone like yourself coming from a Protestant background would go back and make sure I like got everything out of Protestantism that I could to give it a fair shake. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I definitely, you know, that's interesting. Your, your point, I mean, I definitely did not give Christianity a fair shake. <laughs> it's just like, I just, uh, I'm not sure. I think, you know, I got to, I don't know what, I think part of it was uh, at the time my parents were getting divorced and my, okay. my dad let's just say my dad was not on the morally right side of that okay. conflict right so sure. i had a lot of 
anger toward my dad. I didn't want to have anything to do with my dad. I didn't want to be like my dad at all. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I never thought about this until right now when you brought this up, but I mean, maybe had my, had I been more predisposed to my father, maybe I would have been more inclined to search for answers in the tradition that he represented. Right. Cause what happens is, is that, um, I'll, I'll ask people who like come from Christian backgrounds, they might be, become atheists and they go back and they'll become Christian. And then they'll be like this. And, and they, they end up and conclude that this is absolutely the truth. Right. Um, but then they don't get beyond that. Um, and, and that's, that's, that's logical. Like you, you don't like if somebody were to ask me, Hey, Mahin, have you ever thought about any religion other than Islam? I was like, no, because I never like found a reason to like check anything else out. You know what I'm saying? So like, because and, and, and it's not designed to like you know I, I so in that i guess that way you can't fault people when they just like default to their yeah. original whatever their their parents were upon whatever they were raised with so to speak yeah not, i mean if they if they if they're if they're given a comprehensive system yeah by their families or their backgrounds that makes sense but i i, I don't think i was ever given anything close to that sure um, you know, I'm, I'm not faulting anybody, but uh, I mean, I'm I'm grateful for how things turned out. Yeah. So as as I'm listening to you, it seems like you don't ha- you wouldn't have had many biases against um, Islam or Muslims because of how your mom kind of you know taught you to be open minded, having perspective. Yeah, I didn't know very many. I don't think I knew very many Muslims my whole life. I mean, I I remember my freshman year of college in my dorm, there were two Muslim guys that I met. No, actually, in, in my freshman year, probably only one Muslim guy. His name was Sharif. Sharif Anbar Khalas. Khalas, mm. Sharif, if you're out there. Mm. He's half Palestinian, half Spanish. And he lives in Abu Dhabi. Okay. And he was hysterical. Very smart guy. And, uh, I mean, I, I remember asking him this. And I actually, I, it, it sounds so horrible to ask. But, like, I literally, I was asking it, like, sincerely. This is how naive I was. I was like, so how much does a camel cost? Like I asked him that because I thought that he would know the answer to that, which is just <laughs> absurd. So he really got me. He was like, I said, so how much is a camel? He's like, two women. And I was like, what? <laughs> so like, camels were. Oh, yeah. So he was joking. He was like, what kind of idiot question is that? Like, I don't right. know how much a camel costs. So uh, he was the one guy I met. And then, so I almost knew no Muslims before I became Muslim myself. I knew very, I knew only the people who were in my class. Mm. And do, do you think that the fact that, that you were exposed to Islam pre 9-11 is significant? If you're comparing it to yeah. like people who were exposed to Islam after 9-11? I mean, I don't know. I can't tell. Like, I think, because it's, I mean, you remember before 9-11, it's not like people didn't talk about Muslim terrorists. I mean, right. there's like Chuck Norris and Delta Force and like mm-hmm. all that stuff and true, like all this stuff predates 9-11. True lies, true lies right. Predates yeah. So, I mean, uh, it's not like nobody associated Islam with terrorist violence. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if 9-11, I, I mean... I don't know about you, like, but you know, when 9 11 happened, obviously it was really upsetting and terrible and it was traumatic, but it didn't, it didn't shake my view about anything. Like, if anything, I remember thinking, I was like, I just was surprised it hadn't happened earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, I mean, when you're, especially when you're a Muslim and you like, you, you get opened up into like the world of people who are victims of American militarism, you know what I mean? And you're like, yeah. You're like, you're like, I can't believe it. I can't believe no one does anything. You're like, people are so nice to the U.S. Like, Muslims mm-hmm. are so nice. They don't, they don't do anything. They don't like, you know, especially like, I don't know, but like when I travel to the Muslim world, like people are, no one ever was like, oh, you're American. You know, your country's bad. Your country does bad stuff. Like, we're mad at you. Like, no one ever held me accountable for that or was rude to me in any way. Quite mm-hmm. the opposite. Mm-hmm. So when 9-11 happened, I was just, I was, it was horrible, but I was just like, oh, I, I mean, I was just like, of course, this was eventually going to happen. Like, it was just, you know, eventually, like, this, Americans were going to find out that they had been involved in a war that they hadn't, didn't know about. Their big, sure. their government had involved them in a war for several decades that American citizens didn't really, weren't really aware of. And when you're in conflict, and when you're in wars, 
attacks happen. And sometimes those attacks end up hitting civilians. Just to be clear, I completely condemn any killing civilians by anybody, um, by Muslims or non-Muslims. Um, but so that's when I remember, I mean, I remember when 9-11 happened, obviously like I was terrified and everyone was scared. But my main kind of emotional reaction wasn't you know, anger at Islam or anger at Muslims mm. or confusion about my identity. It was more like, like fear that this was just gonna, there was gonna be more of this, that, that this was the beginning of sort of opening up of a conflict that had been suppressed for a long time. Right, right. Um, one thing I was, I was curious about is like, so you, like I, I would consider you as an individual, like I, I, I don't, I, I wanna make sure, my, like, please don't, like, I don't want your ego to get inflated to the point where you can't walk through your door. But you are, I consider you as a person who's a defender of the prophet. Peace be upon him. Well, that's right? very nice. Oh, that's <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, because of the work you've done with Hadith, but misquoting Muhammad, a book for the mainstream, um, you know, anybody can digest, right? It's, you've, you've laid it out really nicely um, of how to, like, process, like, how Islam, like, essentially how we derive what we do, right? <laughs> for laymen. Um, so I think that, uh, what, what, I, what, what thing I always think about is for people of European background, um, I, I always feel like a lot of people, they, they can get into the idea of, um, the, the one God concept, like monotheism, that part of Islam, the first part of the Shahada, but the second part, Muhammad is the messenger of God is something they can't get behind because they see like an unlettered in their perception, a backward Arabian prophet. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, is that something you've ever had to like process for yourself or is that something that just kind of like, w once you like looking at this, it, it, it just made sense from the get go. Was that some, there was no hurdles there ever. Um, sorry, I'm just sending my brother-in-law a message because I think they're downstairs. They want to know something. Um, so that's I mean definitely like so when I when I learned about Islam I really I learned about Islam by reading Fazlur Rahman's major themes of the Quran by reading um, Muhammad Asad's translation of the Quran and by reading Muhammad Asad's Road to Mecca so it, it, these are wonderful books but anybody who knows about Muhammad Asad knows Muhammad Asad is Islamic modernist basically right I mean his his translation of the Quran is I mean, is is uh, is not would not really be within the realm of like what we consider Sunni orthodoxy. Okay. Um, and so I learned about Islam from a very like Quranic and re and reason center, like a very Islamic modernist sort of Muhammad Abdui and Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khani and uh, approach. Sure. Um, so the and in that kind of in that approach to Islam, the, the prophet of Islam is like, I mean, he's essentially like a, a medium for revelation, right? Yeah. He's, his person, his character is sort of almost purposefully um, subordinated. Right. Um, so uh, it, it was, I think a, lo a lot of the reason that I ended up researching and studying Hadith so much and writing so much about it was actually my way of kind of making sense of that aspect of Islam that had not been the door through which I came into the religion. Um, and kind of getting to, to know how Muslims learned about this person and how they made sense of his life and how, how, I mean, I think the big question, which is like, how do you, you know, you have a person who is living in this, seventh century Western Arabian context, which is very different from our world today, which was very different by the way, from Baghdad of 200 years later. So with some like Imam Bukhari or Ahmed bin Hanbal, Allah, right? Where they're writing their books on Hadith. Mm -hmm. Like the prophet's world is as, is very foreign to them. Like this is the first books that are written in Hadith sciences are what's called the Gharib al Hadith books, books about weird words, strange words in Hadith. Okay. The, the the world of like people who live out in the desert with camels all the time and who are desperately poor and for whom like a ladle full of milk is a meal. Like they have like 
let's pass around a ladle. Like when you're reading, I, I'm translating to Ahim Bukhari now, right? So like how many hadiths are there? Like somebody brought, it's like, hey, I have a ladle of milk. Let's sit around and pass around like a ladle of milk. Like imagine that, like, I mean, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but like that's like, mm -hmm. that, that was like, a, that was a party central for them. Okay. We have a ladle of milk, you know? Mm -hmm. We have some like fried meal with, with it's like deep fat fried in butter. Like, let's sit down and eat this. And the imagery they use, like, oh, this is rarer than like this certain color hair on the, the armpit of a donkey. Right. That's an actual phrase, right? So, yeah. Uh, so, you know, this is like bizarre. This was foreign to, even to people in the kind of like someone like Bukhari, who's, you know, from like a big caravan city in Central Asia, mm -hmm. traveled around the Muslim world. Like that was a, you know, like a different universe for him. Mm -hmm. And it's such a different universe for us. So how do you make, you have this person who comes in this very specific context. Some of the things he says and teaches are, are, are very accessible or universally accessible, right? So they they don't, you know, they make complete sense to anybody who comes across them. Some of them are clearly trying to impart universal or generally applicable ideas, but are sort of bound in specific time and place and have to be kind of extracted out and then reapplied. Mm. And some things are just seem to be completely bound up in that time and place and essentially not necessarily applicable beyond that mm -hmm. time and place. Sure. And so what Muslim scholars have always been trying to figure out is like this is our guide. If we're gonna if we're gonna bank on anybody who's gonna be able to tell us the truth about right, wrong, truth, falsehood, real, unreal, God, right? This is the person who we're going to get it from. So let's look at his legacy and we're going to try and figure out how to make sense of this material. Yeah. Um, and that's like what Muslim scholars have always done. And I wanted to kind of just get fully exposed to that process because in a way that was what I as a person was trying to do. Right. Um, and so you know, to this day, everything, all my scholarship is, is always me trying to answer my own questions as a Muslim. It, it's almost like you had this, like what got you in the door, like the Muhammad Assad books, but it had that gap and you, you're like trying to, you've been like fascinated with this gap, so to speak, right? The yeah, definitely. Profit, definitely. Right? I actually really like the, the, of how people get in the door, I think is really um, interesting. So, you know, I was, I was having a conversation with some friends like maybe like a year ago and we were talking about like, if someone's interested in Islam, like what do you, what, like, what books do you give them? Right. And if you want to give them a Sira book, you know, people suggest like Martin Links, for example. Right. But the thing about Martin Links, a lot of people say, well, he's a perennialist. Right. So you, you have that issue or, but someone was like, why don't you give somebody a Karen Armstrong book? And she's not even Muslim. But like the point is like she's able to artic like you, you got to be able to communicate that level. One of the the books that I got that when I was starting to get like more serious about my own religious pursuits was the works of Dr. Jeffrey Lang, mm -hmm. yeah. the math professor at Kansas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, just because and so, and then you would have your like I remember the hardcore Salafi brothers at, on campus would be like, oh, you should listen to him because you know X, Y, and Z, right? And um, you kind of like, but people at different stages, I think, need different things. You know? What yeah, I'm definitely. I mean, definitely. I think, um, yeah, that's why people, I, I try to always, you know, we like at Yaqeen Institute, we, we have this discussion a lot, you know, about, you know, someone will say, oh, how can you have like an article that says this or that has this idea in it? Mm -hmm. And my, my attitude is like, look, you, you have to, you know, you don't want to, you want to have a, as broad a, a door as you can. I mean, some things you are specific with, right? Some things sure. for certain audiences you want to be specific. But you know, why why would you want to limit what you have to offer to people? You know, why? Um, you know, I might have my own views about like visitation of graves or yeah. saints or you know, to sell work or something, but like there's so many people who become Muslim through those things, right? Mm -hmm. And they, um, like, why would I want to 
to to to to deny that to people because you know you so you always have to i think you always really have to 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 the the breadth of our tradition always has to be available to those who know nothing about it like we don't want to yeah people's first exposure should be a broad exposure right and you know i i can't you know and and this is another thing you know muslims like don't realize how some of the things they do can really affect people like when i was talking to this one brother i know he's a lawyer in the uk he does a lot of like human rights law and stuff and there's this really prominent lawyer british lawyer who became muslim and she was like she became muslim like see she said i watched the way you treat your wife and that like really impressed me and then, you know this guy's a nice guy but it's not like he's you know he's not like the greatest husband in the universe at least as far as i know he's probably just like a pretty you know like a normal decent muslim guy yeah but he was this woman was so struck by the way she, he treated his wife that she like that opened her heart to islam so you never know what it is about islam or about being muslim or about our tradition that can really like strike a you know strum a chord in someone's heart and you don't want to deny that stuff to them to people. yeah it's almost like there's this there seems to be this like I wasn't planning on talking about this, um, but there's like this obsession with like creating this idealized community. I almost feel like people who have like, you know, not to name names, but people who have critiqued maybe some of your work or some of the work of Yakin, for example, um, and oh, the American Muslims, how they look. I almost think that I'd want to understand at the root, like, what does your version of American Islam look like then? And I think, I that- you know, yeah, I think like, you know, I, I mean, I'm not at all like a sort of lovey-dovey, you know, Islam is whatever people think it is. I, I, I don't think that at all. Like, I think Islam is a specific yeah. set of beliefs, right? right. Um, it's, there's like a core that's unchanging, that's essential. Right. There's a sort of area outside of that that are, where there's multiple understandings, but you sort of. You pick one of those understandings, you go farther out, it gets like a lot more probabilistic, a lot more contingent, right? And then you get like a lot of cultural ideas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, But, you know, it's something beautiful about seeing like Muslims in South Africa and that they've come to this, like after hundreds of years, they have like an understanding of what it means to be Muslim. And this is like profound to them and meaningful to them and like 100% legitimate and authentic to them, right? And there might be things about that that I don't like or that someone else doesn't like, but, you know, the fact that like they have someone, you know, that they have these like saints, these these like graves of saints around in the mountains around Cape Town. Yeah. And those were like former slaves who were part of the Cape Malay community and like we're, you know, ulama and saints and buried there. And they're like, these people protect us. Like we go to these places, these people, we venerate these people. And, you know, I don't like visiting graves of saints, but I visited those graves. I loved it. Like, you know, and I was like, I was like, this is so beautiful. You know, this is really, and you kind of have to be open to the fact that people experience Islam in different ways and that those ways are actually totally authentic, you know? Um, even if they involve things that I intellectually might not agree with. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think when people try and, people were kind of down on American Islam, right? They're sort of trying to prevent American Muslims from doing that. And to the extent that they are trying to prevent, I think, sort of fatal slides into atheism or a fatal compromises i i agree with them and i would be one of those people who argue mm-hmm. not to do those things right right but there's so many other things where you know like come on you know give people a like you have to let people you have to let a community create a sense of normalcy and a comfortable existence as believers yeah and if you just constantly um sort of shaking that and and destabilizing that 
what are you going to do? Like, it's not like, look, if you're, if you're, if you're a Muslim in the U S you're going to get like a big door prize. If you leave Islam, like anybody who, if you leave, just go leave Islam. you could make a ton of money right now. You could make a ton of money. Just go be like, I'm not Islam. I'm going to tell you all about the horrible stuff that happens in the mosque. I'm going to tell you about my dad and my mom, there's sexual abuse, this, the women, mm. that the like, whatever this, mm. you know, you could go make a ton of money, huge amount of money. And you could go on the speaking circuit. You could be like son of Hamas number five or whatever. Sure. Former suicide and, bomber. Yeah. So like <laughs> you, you know, and, and you, and there's like, and you don't even have to, that's just the most egregious version, but you could yeah. just like, imagine the social love you get by stop. I'm going to stop being different. I'm going to be like, you guys all want me to be, you're going to get love bombed. Yeah. So, you know, it's not like, you know, people need to realize like if you, you know, Muslims, people who are Muslim in this country, who identify as a Muslim are making a real choice and are having like a real commitment. And you do not want to take that for granted. You want to like protect that and nurture that, make those people feel happy, make those people feel proud, make them feel like they're working towards something meaningful and sustainable. Uh, if you just make them miserable, yeah, I'm not sure what what hope one has but 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 so i so i think that people need to like almost because some of these some of these people that are like, some of the disputes that are people that are throwing shade at stuff they're like so they'll nitpick someone someone's allegiance with so-and-so group right i think the root those people everyone needs to kind of like i think determine like lay out there this is what my vision for islam in america should be in 20 30 years maybe it's a south african model right if it's that okay maybe some people it's the khilafah whatever that means and like at least be honest about it and then at least you know when we're at a standstill okay you know we're not going to get beyond this because you're because those kilafa folks would still not respect the south african model right they'd be like well it's oh well, yeah they don't have a full you know whatever um like at least we know what we're working with because right now it seems like there's people are getting hung up on these details, like so-and-so affiliated with this person and this person. I'm like, well, yeah. there's benefit in some of this. We, we, uh, I was doing an Instagram live the other day uh, off the cuff and we were, we were talking about one of these activist folks. And I was like, listen, I disagree with some of her points, right? But she might be right. I can't say that. Yeah. On the flip side, the person who's stuck fearing her saying she's a murtad on some Facebook yeah. thread, I'm more worried about his iman. <laughs> you know, I think one of the problems is that, is that a lot of these... American Muslim debates are about what people are worried is implied by someone's position, mm -hmm. or maybe what everybody knows is implied by someone's position. So I think one of the problems is that because um, discussions about Islam in America are so, well, first they're securitized, right? So, you know, you can't, we can't talk about like the caliphate because then the FBI is going to start listening in on to us, right? Or like, you know, right. you can't start, to, we can't, you know, you can't talk about politics because that's dangerous, right? So, um, and we can't really talk about like gender or sexuality because this stuff is toxic for a whole nother, you know, you get tech feared in another way in society for, for talking about these things, right? It's kind mm -hmm. of culture wars issues. So Muslims are really unable to have like very, a lot of times you can't talk about these things. You can only kind of talk about them in code or insinuation. And so a lot of times people will say like, oh, you know, activist sister so-and-so is saying this. That means she thinks that liwat is halal and she thinks that like, you know, Muslims should do this, that, and the other. Like they don't, they don't know. They, they probably don't think that, right? But they, we, you, you can't just come out and say a lot of this stuff, right? So you, you, you know, the way that our discourses are shaped in sort of the security node and then the kind of culture wars node mm -hmm. it's very hard for people to have really open um transparent communication yeah and what that means is that a lot of these disputes are they're sort of proxy disputes where people are are fighting about what they think other people are working towards or what they think they're working against um and i think actually in reality a lot of times there's a more agreement than people think. Mm -hmm. um, now, some, some people don't agree. Uh, and I, I think there are some, there are some people who say they're Muslims in the United States. Who I don't think are Muslims. Like, I mean, I don't, 
I think there's some things that if people, if, if people say certain things or if they believe certain things, mm. I don't think they're Muslim. And it's not just me who says that. I mean, I, I don't think it, I think it'd be very hard. If someone comes and says to me, and I've seen this happen, you know, that if you do not, they say, I reject the idea of saying the Prophet Muhammad was not a woman. Like I've seen people say this, people who are, say they're Muslim, mm -hmm. say that if you don't think the Prophet Muhammad was a woman, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Like, okay, I don't know what to do with this. Like you're, you know, like we got, I think we're, the path of diverged here, right? So mm -hmm. like if you, if you say you hate the Sharia, if you say you hate the Prophet, if you say you're, you, 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 you hate the Quran, if you say you're angry at God, and you sit around talking about that, like that's just, I, I don't feel that I can be in an, in a community with you, you know? Right. Um, but that's, I don't think there's a lot of people who talk like that. And most of them are in the academy. Like the most of them are <laughs> academics. Like they're not, yeah. they're not people who go to mosques and talk to Muslim communities. Uh, so the people who are like in the Muslim community discussing stuff like this, I mean, I think a lot of times they, they agree more than they disagree. And I think what, tragically, a lot of what the disputes are about are about who is in a position of leadership and, and authority. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that because of the nature of how American Muslim community exists, uh, since even before 9-11, but certainly since 9-11, part of the kind of almost instinctive American establishment reaction to the Muslim problem has been to make sure that the American establishment picks the right Muslim leaders. Yep. So whether it's MLI or activists versus shuyukh or things like that, right? You know, or professors versus uh, imams. Uh, we have this problem, which is that there's constantly a lot of energy devoted to telling the, people from outside the Muslim community picking who the Muslim community's leaders should be and who mm -hmm. they are, yep. and promoting those people. And so like, we can't even, you know, we end up having these arguments, a lot of them, because it's like, you know, this decision, which most communities make for themselves, like we're going to pick who our leaders are, who are going to represent us to the outside world or to other communities. Like we don't get to have those discussions in a, in a kind of protected way or in a, in, a, in a coherent way. Yeah. So a lot of this is like, you know, I'm angry at activist so-and-so because activist so-and-so shouldn't be the person who's leading us or who has this voice, but they do. And why don't I, because I'm an MM and I studied here and I studied there and I'm on the street or whatever. And so you have these, um, you know, I think you get the idea, but I, yeah, so but I, that I think person like, may have like cultivated a relationship over the past 20 years that you didn't know about. Yeah. And that's or, why they yeah. had the exposure, right? That's yeah. why they have the connection to so-and-so, right? Um, you know what I'm saying? Or, it, it, or, by the way, like, you know, you have, there's a difference, right? There's a difference. And this is why I think for me, like the MLI issue was such a big deal, was uh -huh. that this was a very transparent, open instance of people who did not have the best interests of Muslims or the best interests of any kind of moral principle in mind. Mm -hmm. And they were transparently saying, we're going to pick who the Muslim leaders are, or yeah. we're going to groom them, or we're going to put them in place. And you can't allow that. Muslims can't, you know, we can't allow that to happen. Sure. We, that, that's too, that's, this is egregious. But if you have, like, you know, but if there are, you know, activists or people in politics who, who are Muslim, who come up through the ranks of those activities, then instead of seeing that as a problem, you know, we should see that as, as those people as, as assets in our community, right? And, you know, you don't have to agree with them all the time, but you have to have relationships with them. You have to have good, you have to be able to cooperate with them. You have to have common, commonalities and explore your commonalities with them. But because there's this fear that um, behind every person interacting with the greater American community, there's the threat of the loss of our of our religion, um, you can't, people can't do that. Well, some people can't do that with any sense of ease, and everything becomes combat. I I, th I think that's a little overblown, to be on, to be frank. The the idea of like, oh, because of X, Y, and Z activist tweeting about LGBT and X Mashiach saying nothing about it, in two generations we're all going to be disbelievers. 
So I, <laughs> you know, I agree with you, right? But I, look, but okay, one sense, the reason why people have that response, it's not because they're irrational. I mean, they're not doing that because they're hateful people, right? So right. If you go, you know, we all know, we can all point to people in our lives who are having serious crises of faith around exactly like an L, like some kind of LGBT issue. Sure. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. so, you know, to say that this, this type of question is there's something about it that on which people's faith turns and, and, and which can be a kind of eliminating factor for Muslim in this country. Right. So like that's, that's actually a completely accurate perception, mm-hmm. but how you respond to that is the problem, right? So do you, do you sort of panic about that? Do you, you know, insist on these like strident assertions at all times and places that you reject this and that, right? You know, or do you, you know, are you more like strategic? Are you more um, kind of um, uh, less, like, less like combative about it, right? So, yeah, you know, yes, like Muslims have to, Muslims have to, have to come up with a good approaches to deal with questions like that question right but just because we have to have that answer and we have to take it seriously doesn't necessarily mean that that means that anytime somebody says something you don't like everybody has to get in a row and come out and say something against it right so that's just not um that's just not true and it's it not only is not true it's just not it's not strategically intelligent so w- would you agree the sentiment that like the people who are critical has spent their entire time now being critics and we're not building, we're not, and aren't creating solutions. And I think that's, and, and that's what we're trying to do as a community is like try to create solutions, understanding that there's going to be bumps along the road and we'll, yeah. we'll deal with those bumps. But if you're only critiquing, you're not really creating a solution. All you're doing is just critiquing this, critiquing that, and you're creating a community of critics. Right. I mean, I, th- I think that you, you know, one has to, uh, at a, at a certain point, like, you know, you, you have to be able to, in, to, to, to deal with the world around you in the United States. Like, we live in a very diverse, morally, religiously diverse country of lifestyle diversity. Um, and, you know, you have to be able to interact with that world. And you have to be able to, use, like, you know, people can badmouth, like, oh, you work with this group, you compromise with that group. Like, you know, when we, we had this McLean Islamic Center, when they didn't want, the neighborhood would, didn't want to let them have Fajr prayer, all, I, all these other churches and Jewish groups came to the hearing and spoke out and said, we support the Muslims. I mean, I, you should have heard the things they said in support of the Islamic Center. Mm-hmm. And the, that support came from the fact that the people, the heads of this Islamic Center, like my friend Sultan Chaudhry, like they went around and built these relationships. And they didn't, you know, like they dealt with people who didn't agree with them on this and didn't agree with them on that and didn't have the right position on this and didn't have the right position on that. And they sat with them on this and they sat with them on that, right? And um, if you don't build these relationships, you know, you're going to get swallowed up. Mm-hmm. You're not going to be able to function. Right. You know, the trick is how do you have these relationships in a way where you know what your red lines are, where you know when you're being played, where you know when you're being used, right? So it's not about, to have the relationship or not, or to interact or not. It's about how do you do it in an intelligent way? And, you know, in a, in a kind of develop procedures and, and, and processes of, of consultation. Right. Uh, whereas I think a lot of these kind of more harsh critics, they just, they want this like complete disentanglement from that world. Mm-hmm. And uh, almost like this kind of Amish vision. Um, I guess that's possible, but it's very hard to do. Yeah, and I think it's like or like Hasidic Jews in a way. But the other caveat here is that like the Muslim community is under surveillance, etc. You're not going to have. Yeah, I mean, there's other. Yeah, I mean, you if, if you know, it's always funny like to you, you know, Jewish communities in the U.S. Like the stuff that it happens if it were Muslims, like it would just be like the end of the world, like you know, mm-hmm. the absolute end of the world. Um, but I mean, I would actually like to have a lot more of that because those th- the communities are still completely embedded in the worlds around them. Like, 
they interact with the police and with local government and with the, that they're on all the school boards. And like, you know, they, they're totally involved in American life. Mm-hmm. They just, part of that involvement is for them to create their own spaces and atmospheres and to control those spaces and atmospheres. Yeah. That's it's great. a smaller actually, group. Right. But maybe, to, maybe no, go ahead. So maybe those from Muslims, maybe, well, maybe those guys who are just critical can do their own little, cause there is like Islam Berg in like upstate New York. Right, they're doing their own thing. They got their own little enclave. Um, they don't bother nobody. You know, they're not on social media like tech fearing so and so. They're kind of doing their own yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah, but you know, the thing is that yeah, you're right. But the thing is that that's not the people that these sort of like Facebook incel Muslim dudes. Yeah, they're not those people, right? So the the people that these critics are kind of drawing on and energizing are not people who are going to go settle in these places. There are people who are in the, who are t- who are constantly in- interacting with the larger American society or larger western society around them. Mm-hmm. And those people have to find a way to do that productively. Not right. in a kind of cheesy pr- I mean productive in like the sense of being an American citizen. I mean I don't have a problem with that, but I'm not I'm not saying that's the standard. What I'm saying is that they they're not doing it in a way that's productive for them as people for them as believers, for them as like useful servants of God. Sure. Uh, um, I got to go. Okay. Fortunately. Perfect. Um, it's been a good discussion. Yeah, good. Because yeah. I, I was going to like, I was going to skip the Israel-Palestine conflict. The only other thing I was going to ask you is, do you have a quick top five movies of all time? Wow, boy, that's tough. <laughs> I mean, I can tell you my favorite movies. Sure, your favorite. That's all I care about. I, mean, I don't my, care. Yeah, my two, uh, I would say that my two favorite ones are um, Ma- uh, Last of the Mohicans, not the director's cut. It's very hard to get the non-director's cut. With not, Daniel not Day-Lewis? Direct- yeah. Okay. And a Master and Commander with Russell Crowe. And I'd say other movies that I really like. Boy. These are movies that you just would watch all over. Like you don't. Have, it doesn't have to be. Okay, like, I, you know what? I can't. I could. Uh, beyond that, I'm gonna go with movies that I will. If it's on, I'll watch it. Yeah, that's that. That's okay. my standard kind of thing, right? Uh, any of the first three Star Wars. Okay. But def- but certainly Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Um. Any Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. Pacific Rim. If Pacific Rim is on, I'll like. I'm like, okay, Pacific Rim's on. That's it. Everything else will stop. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Die Hard, Big Trouble in Little China, um, Ghostbusters. Um, so th- these are movies you probably watched when you were a kid, like literally in the '80s. Some of these. Yeah. Right? Well, not 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 Pacific Rim. Okay. Uh, oh, The Man from Uncle, the new one, the Guy Ritchie movie. Okay. Uh, I'm waiting for you to say some movie that I actually like have like actually care about other than the Schwarzenegger one Terminator movie right or Terminator 2 <laughs> I yeah. don't know what movies what movies would my, you my, say my, my, my movies of like the movies I, I really enjoy are, okay so Terminator Varsity Blues um, I like Rudy Malcolm X uh, Godfather 1 and 2 I, I even like part 3 to be honest um, mm-hmm. Scarface uh, Rudy did I say Rudy Friday Night yeah, hey, yeah. I, I love sports movies right yeah um oh okay you know what i like as a sport movie is uh any given sunday yeah i, I didn't really something about i saw it in the theater and when i was living in toronto and th- didn't really care for it too much so i'm just like so we must have just have a different taste in movies i think yeah uh like, i've never even like i mean try re-watching any given sunday I, i'd be interested to know if you like it if you gave it a second chance maybe maybe i'll, I'll check it out maybe after ramadan and stuff but anyways i'll i'll, I'll let you get going i know it's like 11 30 eastern so uh yeah i gotta go and we gotta have round two of dinner all right sounds good i right, appreciate it, dr brown uh we will uh talk to you soon and um take care I'll, I'll let you know this this i'm gonna put this up on youtube probably the next day or so and then i'll get into the podcast format probably in the next couple of weeks okay so. Can you, uh, can I listen to it first? I, or is that, is that bad? I can send it to you. That's fine. Yeah, I just want to know. My, I don't want to say anything that's going to, my wife's going to get angry at. So I want to sure, look sure. out. Yeah, what, what, mean, what, I'll, what I'll do is I can put it on YouTube as private and I'll send you the link. 
Okay. I, I generally, I don't like to, I mean, I don't think I say anything that I, that I can't say, but. Uh, I, it didn't sound, I, I didn't catch anything problematic. Okay. So, well, but, send me the link and I'll listen to it right quick. And get back sure. To you. No problem. Sounds good. All right. Take care. But yeah. Hopefully we get to meet in person one day, inshallah. We met in person before. Before. Where, it's now or something? You, at, at you, Chicago. Long, no way. Pre-podcast days. What year do you think it was? 2013, 2012, probably. You came to do a talk um, about Usul al Fiqh. I was living in Hyde Park at the time. Oh, uh, interesting. And was uh, it a talk at the university? It was. Uh, Muhammad Ballin was there. Rodrigo Eden. Adam, yeah, that's funny that I met Muhammad Ballin. I didn't realize I met him. Oh, yeah. I'm glad we met. I'm yeah, glad we, we met. Like, I, we, I, we, I was, you gave me your card. I remember we were, I was walking to your car. You had to catch a flight. So I was like walking to your car and I was just talking about inviting you to a masjid. Pro- like, I thought maybe we'd invite you to, before this podcasting stuff, I said, yeah. try to invite people to like random weekend programs, et cetera. Right. Um, so this is like, yeah, it was like 2013 ish. So I, oh, I, I, that's I, cool, man. Yeah. So yeah, we, we, we didn't meet. It just seems like before another era, so to speak. So, <laughs> well, I All hope right. we can meet again. Sounds Inshallah. good. All right. Take care, All man. Right. All right. Like All right.